everyone. Um, my name is Lenora Henson, and I'm the Interim Deputy Director, Curator, and Director of Public Programming here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site. On behalf of our Board of Trustees and staff, I'd like to welcome all of you to Speaker Night. I'd especially like to welcome Elizabeth garner Mazurik, who is our guest speaker this evening. Speaker Night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to come in and help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today. The TR site speaker, speaker Night series is made possible by, a gener by the generous support of m and Bank, as well as the New York Council on the Arts, NISCA. Our sincere thanks to both of those groups. I should also mention that NISCA's support has enabled us to record all of our speakers, not only this year, but last year. So if you've missed any of them, I hope you will check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. As I mentioned, we are joined this evening by Elizabeth garner Mazurek. Elizabeth is a historian of the welfare state and women in the progressive era, in progressive era America. So this is right in, we're right in her wheelhouse. Um, she's currently completing her PhD in history at the University of Buffalo, where she also specializes in curriculum development for UB programs. Elizabeth holds a BA from the University of Texas at Austin and an MA from UB. She's a fellow in the University of Buffalo Institute for the Research on Women and Gender and a fellow with the Humanities Institute. Her article, Por la Raza, Por la Raza, Yovia Idar and the Progressive Era Mexicana Maternalism in the Texas-Mexican Border, was recently published in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly. Additionally, Elizabeth is a co-producer for the award-winning podcast, um, Dig, a history podcast. And if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with it, I totally recommend it. It's a lot of fun and I love listening to them. Um, actually, listening to that is what made me reach out and invite her to speak on this topic. Uh, Elizabeth's topic tonight is Women, Baby, Babies, and Death, the U.S. Children's Bureau in Progressive Era America. Having said that, I'm delighted to turn the podium over to Elizabeth. Please join me in welcoming her. Dig a history podcast, and we we do series, so we'll do like four episodes and kind of a series, and then we'll choose an, another topic or whatever to do it. And so one of the series we did, um, it's me and three other women, and we're all historians. And so we we did a, a a series on our own research, right? So what is our current research? What are our books about? Our dissertations, or what have you? Um, and so I look at gender in the progressive era. I specifically look at women reformers and you know what were they reforming, what were they railing against, and how they really kind of stepped into the political sphere, especially when the majority of states were not the time. So it's kind of you know where I fall, you know, in the progressive era. Um, I'm also more generally interested in kind of how the welfare state formed. Um, a lot of the times people will think about the welfare state forming in the 1930s with the New Deal. And when we really start looking at it, we see that uh, a lot of the kind of programs that we would associate with welfare state really start during the progressive era. Um, and a lot of those progressive reformers actually are the mature people at the head of departments during FDR's time. So people like Francis Perkins, who was there to witness the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City, you know, New York City, right? So she, she goes on to become Secretary of Labor. Or Mary McLeod Bethune, right, who was a progressive era reformer um, in the National Association of Colored Women, right? So she goes on to lead the, the black board of FDR's uh, black office. Um, so this is really where a lot of that starts. So that's kind of where I come from. So during the, there we go. Uh, during the late 19th and early 20th century, America faced the largest discrepancy of wealth that it had ever seen. And many people were living in extreme poverty. Um, so here, I know the, the sun might be a little bright, but you know, this is, these are people sleeping in a doorway. So, you know, something we unfortunately have seen before, but the thing that's different about this is there are children in the doorway. So that's something that we definitely would not see. 
Um, and so there were a lot of people living in extreme pro poverty. And a lot of it, it, it's not that they weren't working, right? It's not that people weren't working. For example, steel workers uh, worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, and yet were still extremely poor, right? It was also during the labor movement. They don't, they don't have those unions yet, right? Um, and, and this is an international thing going on. Uh, this, is, this is also uh, in Europe as well as America, and there are a lot of people around the world that um, are feeling that the only way to fix this kind of problem is to abolish capitalism, right? To turn to socialism, communism, now that meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? But they're, they're saying, look, this, this, this isn't working, right? Something that has to happen. Uh, others felt that capitalism could be reformed without being overthrown, okay? Um, and many of those people are who we would call progressive era reformers. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but her crown actually says London. I just like this picture, but again, that kind of gives you the idea that this was a very international kind of movement. Um, there's a great book called Atlantic Crossings about kind of the progressive era ideas traveling back and forth between um, Britain and America, if you're interested in that kind of thing. But, so these progressive reformers, they, they felt that capitalism could be reformed without being overthrown. That it could be fixed without violent revolution. And so how did they propose to do this? Um, they said that uh, it, it was their idea to, to use government power. And, and this, in America, was a very new perspective. So up until this point, it was assumed that government um, at some level, especially that kind of government over there, very far away, was the biggest threat, right? And progressives maintained that the national government was basically the only thing large enough that could confront these giant um, conglomerates of capital power. Um, so that the threat was actually not coming from the government, but it was coming from capitalism, from these corporations. So in this progressive movement, we have the muckrakers, which I'm sure probably all of you are very familiar with. These were journalists that were kind of um, trying to highlight the underbelly of this, uh, in some people's respect, capitalism gone awry, right? So they're trying to show the child laborers. You've got Ida Tarbell doing an expose on the Standard Oil Company and how it was kind of eating up and putting all of these other oil companies out of business. You have photographers like Jacob Reese um, going into the slums and the tenements of New York City and taking pictures, or pictures by Lewis Hine, who took pictures of child laborers. Colliers did a huge expose on the patent drug business and exposed the dangerous components of a lot of medicines that were sold over the counter, what we call patent medicines. Um, so for example, medicines that were marketed towards children had things like cocaine and morphine and laudanum in them, right? So I, I have this doubled because I wanted you to see that it's, it, this was the cover of the magazine and then this is it just a little bit bigger. It says the patent medicine trust palatable poison for the poor. You have uh, laudanum and cheap poisonous alcohol and then all of these are like the various like, you know, babies, soothing syrup. Opium and laudanum kind of thing. So it's just it's kind of one of those iconic like pictures from the era. And then this one you're probably familiar with as well, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Okay, his expose of the Chicago meatpacking industry. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually read The Jungle and he thought it was exaggerated, and so he sent a commission in to check out the conditions that Sinclair had written about. And his commission came back and said that it was actually worse. <laughs> then what Sinclair had wrote about. Um, so he actually, Sinclair actually set out to highlight the poor working conditions of the immigrant laborers that were working in the meatpacking plants. Um, but what the public got out of it was the disgusting and unsanitary condition that food was being processed in. And so Sinclair is famous for saying, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit them in the stomach. <laughs> So one of these progressives was our friend, Theodore Roosevelt. TR was a Republican. Uh, there were also uh, progressives who were Democrats. 
Um, they were minorities in both parties, but they were also significant and major players in both parties. Uh, Roosevelt ran for governor of New York on the strength of his reputation as a war hero. Uh, and while he was governor is when we catch the first glimpse of him playing out some of his progressive goals. Uh, that government should be used as an instrument to improve people's lives. So for example, as governor, he approved an eight-hour workday. He pushed legislature to, uh, legislation to repeal a law that allowed localities to set up segregated schools. Uh, he fired the secretary of insurance from his own party because he was corrupt. So Roosevelt in power was actually acting out and putting into law many of the things that progressives were pushing for. Uh, even before he was governor, uh, and he worked at the, as a police superintendent in New York City, he actually spent some time with Jacob Reese uh, going into the slums of the tenements in New York. So you've kind of seen this firsthand. Um, but despite Roosevelt's record as a reformer, he always maintained that he was a conservative. Um, and he said that the best alternative to the radical changes being proposed, the best way of handling that kind of critique of capitalism, was to institute some reforms. Uh, he said that the government had to step in and make changes in order to preserve stability. Uh, so essentially he's saying that, you know, if we don't do something to ease suffering a little bit, this whole system is gonna topple, right? The, the poor is gonna eat the rich kind of thing. And we need, we need to uh, institute some alleviation so that we can have stability and kind of get back to an even ground. Um, and so Roosevelt championed new laws like the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, which led to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, its main purpose was to ban foreign and interstate traffic in adulterated and mislabeled food and drug products, and directed the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry to inspect products and refer offenders to prosecutors. It required that active ingredients be placed on the label of a drug's packaging and that drugs could not fall below purity levels. So, you know, things that kept fingers and morphine out of things people consumed, right? Kind of take that for granted. You know, these were, these were radical, right? This, this was curbing capitalism in a way. Look, we want you to make money, but you have to do things to make it safe, kind of thing, right? So, let's get to the ladies. Now, women made up a huge uh, part of these progressive reformers, and they made a huge impact on how America was shaping into a modern nation during the Progressive Era. So the, per uh, the period from about 1890 to 1920 is often called the Women's Era. And women were into everything. They were major players in labor reform, in health reform, in temperance, in educational reform. You name it, women, women were the movers and the shakers of these. Uh, and they were, you know, they. They had always been at the forefront of a lot of reforms. You know, the abolitionist movement, temperance starts way before the Progressive Era. Right? These are these are women who led um, reform movements, and that just kind of expands and explodes when we get to the Progressive Era. Uh, so groups like the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Association of Colored Women, the Mo Mothers Congress, which um, turns into the Parent and Teachers Association, so PTA, any of you ever did the PTA that uh, started during this period as well. So all of these large and far-reaching organizations really start to flourish during the period. Women joined the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, in droves. Uh, it was founded in 1874, but by 1890 it had 150,000 members, and this made it one of the largest women's organizations in the United States. Uh, Frances Willard was the president and leader of the organization, and she led the movement to embrace a broad array of reforms. So the WCTU, we think of them as the teetotalers, right? That, uh, you know, no drinking. But they had as a motto, do everything. Um, so they were very progressively conservative. Uh, they were, you know, a pro-suffrage. Right? So in order for women to protect the home, in order for women to protect families by keeping alcohol out of it, women had to have the right to vote, right? Women had to have the right to vote to clean up government, all this kind of, you know, these, these kind of ideas, right? So, so they had this kind of do everything tent. Whatever we can do to alleviate suffering, we're going to do it. Um, the WCT was actually really big in the social purity campaign, which was against prostitution and vice. Not necessarily because we, they were prudes, but because it exploited women, right? Because there was this double, double standard that women couldn't work and therefore if they became single mothers or whatever, some, sometimes the only 
option open to them was prostitution, right? So that's why they were against it. It was this kind of early feminist um, movement in a way, but one that we would consider conservative in, in a lot of aspects. And so many of these progressive reforms um, were to protect the home, to protect the nuclear family, and, and the vulnerable in society. So a lot of these um, reformers were middle class reformers, and they um, were were the the nuclear family and you know a, a male breadwinner were, were kind of the ideal in this sense. So again, this kind of progressive conservatism, right? Um, but one of the major reforms that particularly women were getting involved in were reforms dealing with the health and protection of women and children. Peace. So the death of a young child was a very real and emotional experience for our many families during the era. However, at the dawn of the 20th century, many Americans came to expect a better outcome in the life expectancy of the children, right? So in this new day age of industrial capitalism, with rapidly changing technology, uh, medical professionalism, and increasing wealth, America should have had one of the lowest percentages of child and infant deaths out of all of the industrializing uh, nations. This was not the case, however. In 1900, America ranked 10th among principal nations in infant mortality, and the estimated national infant mortality rate was 100 per 1,000 live births, <clears throat> resulting in over 230,000 infant deaths per year. And the maternal, mater maternal mortality rate was 15,000 deaths per year. The actual numbers were probably much, much higher um, because there was no official data. The United States at this time did not have a uniform system in place to register births. Uh, so just to put this in perspective, kind of the numbers, in 1900 there were 70, 76 million people in the United States. Um, now we have 323 million people living in the United States. So, you know, 230,000 sounds not so, not so big, right? compared to the amount of people in the US. But you know, at that time, it was a very, very high amount. And it was very typical for you or a woman that you were close to or in your family to have had experienced the death of a child. That was just a very common, common experience. Um, and it, it touched pretty much every you know, American family. So because the United States did not have a system in place to adequately register births, they never had a you know, true number of, of, of how many infant deaths there really were. Uh, there were pockets in America, like in New York City, with, uh, that were working towards more accurate birth records, but the majority of states had no systematic programs to, to gather this data. Uh, rural area, areas in the US were the least accounted for. Now, on one hand, this was a result of federalism, right? So each state had different systems or they had no systems at all, and determining accurate infant birth and death rates. Um, but another reason uh, infant mortality was not ac actually accurately tracked was that there was no central organizing board to do such calculations. So, of course, we did have the census, right? We did have the Census Bureau, and they counted the population every 10 years, but they didn't implement any protocols for registering every infant birth between census. Right, so if the census taker comes around in, in 1900 and say your baby born died in 1891, you're probably not going to mention that nine years later. You, know, you might have had another infant death in the, in the interim. I think. Um, but by the 1910s, numerous industrialized countries already had enacted programs to document, um, you know, childbirth and mortality maternal mortality rates. So America's pretty far behind in that. Uh, so this is Florence, Florence Kelly and Lillian Hall, and these are two of these kind of uh, heavy hitters during the progressive era, these women performers. Uh, Florence Kelly was a labor rights and children's rights advocate. Uh, she founded the National Consumers League in 1909. She lived and worked in uh, Chicago's Hall House settlement before she moved to New York City and lived and worked with the Henry Street settlement. So the National Consumers League, many of the consumer goods that were made in the late 19th century 
uh, were geared towards women as consumers. Uh, so we start seeing things like vacuum cleaners and washing machines, not the washing machines we have with those like, totally great ones, right? Um, but these were marketed towards women as labor-saving devices. And most women, as, as a lot are now, were the major purchasers of goods for the home. You know, they were the ones that were going out and purchasing the groceries and the furniture and the new appliances for home. And so through this, women realized that because they were so integral to this, you know, this growing economy, this growing consumer culture, it really gave them powerful leverage to bring about changes and reform. Um, so Florence Kelly, when she founded the National Consumers League, they sponsored boycotts, they encouraged consumers to buy products that were made without child labor. Again, we saw that in the abolitionist movement, right? So abolitionists were not buying um, cotton or they, you know, they weren't wearing cotton or anything that was made with slave labor, slave labor right? So the same kind of idea. We're not going to purchase anything that's made with child labor. Um, so these are, this is one of kind of the first national kind of you know boycott <coughs> movements, so to speak. Uh, and then we've got the Henry Street Settlement was founded by Lillian Walt in New York City. Um, so Henry Street Settlement is very much like Chicago's Whole House. Um, they you know did kind of outreach into the community, health reforms, classes. Um, you name it, they were they were kind of into it, right? Um, Lillian Wall was actually a nurse by trade, uh, and she was the um, she led the campaign to establish the New York City Bureau of Child Hygiene. Um, she also developed the concept of public nursing. And this picture is awesome because that is a public nurse oh, climbing on the rooftops of tenements in order to get down into one to go and be a nurse in one of these tenements, right? So these two reformers and many, many, many others believed that in this progressive spirit, this belief that the government had a responsibility to do good, to protect life, that there needed to be some kind of national agency that could collect and disseminate information regarding the welfare of children in America. Uh, in 1903, Wald and Kelly enlisted the aid of Edward T. Devine, who was a longtime political associate of President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he also was the editor of the survey. Can you guys read uh, magazines from the era? Um, and so they wanted to introduce this idea to TR of a federal children's bureau. And Roosevelt famously replied, bully, come on down and tell me about it. You know, you can see him with his big bully, that sounds awesome, right? So, so they tromp down and they're telling him about it, right? So it's Wall Divine, Jane Adams, uh, Mary McDowell, who's another famous uh, or former whole house resident. They all kind of met with TR to argue their case. And what they was needed, they were arguing, was it a physical bureau in Washington that could coordinate information pertaining to child welfare, right? So they could get accurate numbers, so they could help people, you know, what to do to help save their babies, right? Um, now, numerous charity organizations across the country were involved in programs to alleviate infant mortality, child working conditions, and family poverty. Um, but these were all voluntary organizations, right? They were piecemeal and they were scattered everywhere. Um, the states and private organizations up to that point had shown that they weren't capable, capable of enacting any kind of real changes on their own. They needed some kind of central organizing authority backed by federal dollars to organize these child welfare efforts. Um, and so they're, they're arguing that the Children's Bureau would become a kind of clearinghouse in which um, you know, separate studies and programs could be analyzed, organized, and acted upon under one roof. Now, Roosevelt privately endorsed the idea, but he declined to publicly endorse it um, until a few years later. And that's you know, just like today, something, this was kind of radical, right? So, so a politician's going to listen to it and they're going to sit on it a little bit and then see where the wind's blowing and then they might go that way, right? So the first, uh, we call this the first White House Conference um, uh, on Child Welfare was convened in 1909. And this is the only picture I can ever find of this conference. And I mean, obviously they're sitting at a fancy dinner. But if you are into reformers during the era, your person was at this meeting, right? This was the who's who of 
charity workers and reformers, they, you know, all denominations, um, Catholics, Jewish people, unfortunately African Americans were not uh, necessarily well represented, although Booker T. Washington was at this meeting. Huge meeting, right? A, a meeting of the minds. What can we do about this mortality problem? What can we do about you know, these poor, quote unquote, street urchins running the street? What can we do about adoptions? All of this kind of kind of stuff, right? So this could mean in 1909. Um, Jacob Reese was there, Jane Adams was there, everybody, right? So the a report from the conference, um, basically the conference declared that children were deserving of special measures to ensure their protection and well-being, right? That's, that's the statement, right? Children are worthy of protection, right? Um, and so this is a really important landmark in kind of this modern era's shift in attitude towards the relationship between children and the state. Um, so while urging the importance of the home and the preservation of the family, uh, it also provided official recognition of the government's responsibility for the welfare of the child. And it upheld the state's right to intervene in the private sphere of family on children's behalf. Now, one of the outcomes of this conference was more support for a children's bureau type organization that would collect and disseminate information affecting the welfare of children. Now, many advocates for small government felt that the government had no authority to distribute persuasive data, or propaganda as they called it, regarding health and child welfare. Um, Homer Folks, who you may be uh, familiar with, was uh, president of the Children's Aid Society in New York, you know, so charity guy, charity reformer. Um, he believed that it would be a mistake for the Federal Children's Bureau to take on many of the things that would be extremely proper and extremely desirable for a voluntary association to undertake. Right, so he's saying, no, you have to leave this up to voluntary associations. James E. West, who was secretary of the National Child Rescue League, argue that it, quote, it is not the function of a government body to do promotional work. So they wanted to see some kind of governing board. They were, they were okay with that, that was organized on a voluntary basis, right? So they still wanted to keep this, this stuff kind of in the private charities. Now proponents of the Federal Bureau, um, they saw federal action as the only means of systematically collecting and distributing this enormous amount of data that needed to be collected and analyzed. Um, so individual states and scattered charity organizations really had thus far not been able to collect the kind of data that they, they needed. This is also the era of the rise of social work, right? Collect data, make maps, um, scientific homemaking. Right? So everything, everything's mapped and, and you know, now you go to the doctor and the doctor takes notes, right? That, that was new during this time, right? He's kind of taking notes and documenting somebody's movement through a welfare organization. That's all new during this time. You know, and, and those women are women saying, those reformers are saying, we need, we need something from the bigger, from the government to do that kind of stuff. So women were largely behind organizing efforts for creating a federal children's bureau. And there is this web of women, women's voluntary organizations going on during this time. So I mentioned the kind of rise of voluntary organizations and the rise of the women's era uh, during this period. So the National Consumers League, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Congress of Mothers, Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, all of these organizations really kind of kick into high gear and start campaigning uh, for a bill to pass this, this Federal Children's Bureau, right? Uh, women's clubs embarked on a massive letter writing campaign to convince their representatives and their senators that they needed to pass this bill. Now this is interesting, right? Because in most states, women could not vote. Um, but of course, one of the arguments against allowing women to vote was that their husband's vote counted for them both. Um, and politicians well understood that many women had their husband's ear, and it probably wasn't wise to ignore this constituency. Right? So, so they're really pushing political reforms before many of them have to vote. So there's President Taft. I'm sorry it's such a bad picture, but that's the only one we have of him signing the Children's Bureau bill. 
So the bill creating the U.S. Children's Bureau was passed and signed into law in 1912 by President Taft. Um, yet there were still some charity reformers and politicians who were opposed to the formation of the Bureau. Some of these opponents, citing fears of government bureaucracy, large salaries, and infringement on states' rights, um, they feared that the Bureau would, quote, invade rights with, which have existed since the foundation of the national government and are, by its constitution, entrusted to the individual states. So although this is the progressive era and there was a lot of progressive reforms, there was obviously two sides to every story. And not everybody was happy with this. And this is just a still from, you know, kind of a silent film. They have little newsreels or whatever before, before a film. Um, just kind of letting the public know about um, the Children's Bureau and things that they were doing. So there were many, of course, who were glad to see the formation of the Bureau. The New York Times published an article applauding the formation of the Children's Bureau, saying that reform efforts geared towards children had been piecemeal, or as the Times stated, split up into bits and had therefore been insoluble. So Julia Lathrop was appointed the first chief of the U.S. Children's Bureau, which made it the first major government organization to be headed by a woman. Uh, Lathrop's life is pretty interesting. Her life changed dramatically when in the winter of 1888-1889, somewhere around there, Helen Gates Starr and Jane Addams traveled to Rockford Seminary, excuse me, Rockford Seminary, their alma mater, where Julia was going to school at the time, to promote Full House Settlement in Chicago. Uh, and Lathrop was so inspired that she, um, she joined the, the residents. Um, she became a volunteer visitor for the Cook County Charities, and allowed, it allowed her the opportunity to observe the desperate circumstances of the average American. Many of her findings were published in uh, the Whole House maps and papers. If you've ever seen these, these were really large maps that Whole House created, and they're very detailed. Again, that kind of rise of social work, right? They have each little square block designated as to what was in the block and who was living there. Is this a brothel? Is this a you know tenement? And it's colors and everything. They're really cool to look at. Um, you can see prints of them online if you're interested. Um, and so a lot of that was Julia Lathrop creating those. Uh, she became the uh, first resident of Hall House to receive a state position to the Illinois Board of, Board of Charities. And in 1912, President William Howard Taft appointed her as the chief of the U.S. Children's Bureau. Um, so this is uh, one of many of the kind of charts and graphs that the Children's Bureau uh, created. It's so cool to look at these because, you know, these are all hand painted. Right? I mean, this is before big print shops and you know, you just send it out to Kinko's, right? So these are all hand created and there's lots of pictures of, of women, you know, making these of paint and paintbrush. It's kind of cool. Uh, but with Julia Lathrop at the head, the Children's Bureau first turned to the alarming infant mortality rates among impoverished city dwellers. So the Bureau wrote popular instructional pamphlets on prenatal and infant care and encouraged baby-saving campaigns. They fought to expand birth registration campaigns and studies of infant mortality, um, though its focus was almost exclusively the high death rate among immigrants, in, uh, immigrants infants and the equally high infant mortality rate among African Americans was largely unresearched. Between 1914 and 1920, the Bureau expanded, allowing it to explore issues of child labor, to research maternal and child health, to fight for mothers' pensions, and to deal with the problems of illegitimacy and of children with disabilities. So they really start to expand their reach as they move on. The U.S. Children's Bureau was the leading provider of information about adoption up until roughly 1940. Uh, it was also instrumental in setting standards for adoption agencies and guiding state legislatures, social workers, researchers, and the public in every aspect of adoption. Um, and just as a side note, some of my personal research, I'm not ready to present it yet, but I'm really uncovering the magnitude of their studies of illegitimacy that has really kind of been understudied in the history of the U.S. Children's Bureau. A lot of it does focus on infant mortality, 
Um, and as I'm going through old newspapers, like I'm looking in the Chicago uh, Defender, which was an African American newspaper in Chicago, the New York Times, and this and the other, I'm finding ads from the Children's Bureau about illegitimacy. And they had some major studies about illegitimacy. I also study a group called the Florence Crittenden Mission, which in its later years was really an adoption agency, but very early on was an agency that was trying to keep uh, single mothers with their children. Right? They were trying to provide a way for, for mothers and babies, mothers of single mothers to stay with their children. And so the Children's Bureau actually used a lot of the statistics from the Florence Crittenden Mission for these uh, Ill uh, illegitimate illegitimacy studies that they were doing. So it's really interesting and fascinating, and maybe someday I'll come back and tell you about it if, if anybody's interested. Uh, but the first major effort uh, undertaken by the Children's Bureau was a focus on infant mortality. Um, they also instigated, oops, so there's one of the ladies with the, the pen. Right? But they also uh, started uh, birth registration. Um, and this is really interesting. It is a door-to-door -door campaign to collect birth records. And thousands of women connected with this uh, network of voluntary women's organizations, they took on government work as volunteers for the Bureau. So basically, we have private citizens going out and kind of doing this government work. So women from the National Congress of Mothers, Daughters of the American Revolution. All of these women are, are knocking door to door with copies of standardized birth certificates. Also, again, like looking through newspapers at the time, there are all of these kind of hyper sensationalized stories about people that are like prodigal sons or whatever coming home to, to inherit daddy's estate or whatever, but they were never registered. And so they can't get their inheritance and that kind of thing. Um, so there's this real big effort, like all these kind of newspaper things are, are you registered? You know, like, go check. Do you have a birth certificate? That kind of thing. Uh, again, something you kind of take for granted, right? But, it, you know, this, this cadre of women are really going out and kind of doing this work for the government. And so they would go out door to door and they'd get people to fill these things out and then they'd all send them back into the Children's Bureau for analysis, um, where then they would kind of compile it. Um, and, you know, it's a... It's a an example of making the personal political. You know, this, this thing that a lot of women, in good death, a lot of women and families had kind of experienced within the domestic sphere of the home, right, is becoming part of the state, right? A woman is coming to your door, opening your door, and they're having this kind of camaraderie with them. Like, okay, we've both experienced it through death. There's a political movement behind this, right? Uh, but they did not rely on volunteer labor alone, but employed uh, a large group of female social workers and statisticians. Uh, so this is one of the you know, few government agencies that, that have primarily women working um, in it. The Bureau conducted eight intensive studies between 1912 and 1918 that focused on infant mortality rates in cities ranging from 24,000 people to one half million. Uh, so almost all of these uh, bureau employees were women, and they con were conducting these sociological field studies. They would travel to their respective uh, cities, and they would partner with uh, local health nurses and public health nurses in these, in these cities to kind of get these uh, this data kind of kind of analyzed, right? So here's some kind of old posters on that. Uh, many Children's Bureau reports showed that poverty had a direct correlation to infant mortality, but it was not the sole determining factor. Um, let's see, I, I know I'm running a little bit of time, so I'm going to kind of skip. So, so one, of the, one of the ways we know how women were interacting with the Children's Bureau is we have this great cache of letters that women wrote to, to Julia Lathrop. Dear Julia Lathrop, my baby died. Uh, my baby's sick. I am bleeding after having a baby. What do I do? Like these really intimate health questions, like written to her. And she would write back, or one of her deputies would write back. And so in the National Archives, there are these great back and forth personal letters of these women um, kind of experience, you know. Giving, giving us a glimpse into the life that they were experiencing. So I'll read you a couple 
Uh, one, one woman wrote, my baby's eyes had been so sore, nobody worried but myself. And I did only because I had read the danger of blindness in your books. So in the pamphlets that the Children's Bureau had passed out. No one here ever saw a doctor do anything for a newborn's baby's eyes. Right? So she had read it in this pamphlet and knew, oh my gosh, something's wrong. I need to do something about this. Um, some of the letters written to the Children's Bureau showed the anger that women felt over the death of children, um, which they felt was entirely preventable. One well-off woman wrote about the death of her baby's son and an inadequate medical advice she had received. Quote, my baby was sacrificed through mere ignorance. This happened in the capital of Illinois, and money nor efforts were spared to save him. I soon found that not only mothers of large families knew nothing about the scientific care of babies, but the best doctors in the city knew less. I could not nurse my baby, and he just faded away, never gaining, or rather losing weight all the time on the many foods which the different doctors tried. Right, so these grieving mother, among thousands of others, they became mobilized through their own experience and through those of their friends and acquaintances. Uh, and they bemoaned the lack of trustworthy medical advice, um, and so really started looking to the state as kind of this arbiter of, of, uh, of, of knowledge. Um, let's see, there's an example of one of these letters. So here's all the iterations of prenatal care. So this is what they looked like, you know, 1912, 1913, and then all the way, looks up to maybe the 70s right there. In 1965, the Department of Health, Education, and Wellness estimated that one copy of infant care, which was continually published since 1914, had been distributed for every three babies born in the last 50 years. So it's a huge um, kind of effort of public dissemination. Um, and then just real quick, I'll try to move on. So in 1917, Julia Lathrop says, okay, we need, we need some federal money. We need, we need a little more. We're doing good work, we need a little more. And so this, this program, she wants a program that would include public health nurses, it would include pre and postnatal care for mothers and babies, um, and accessible health care for children. And her proposed program became known as the Shepherd Towner Act. Um, and again, to get this passed, we have this cadre of women um, so we have the Women's Joint Congressional Committee. It's a coalition of lobbyists and major women's organizations. We have the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the National Mothers Conference, the National Women's Trade Union League, the YWCA, um, and then also major magazines, Good Housekeeping, Women's Home Companion, McCall's, Ladies Home Journals, are all um, posting these, these ads that said, write your representative to support the Shepherd Tower Bill. Push for this. Now this is 1920, 1921. What has happened? Women have the right to vote, right? They don't know how women are gonna vote yet. They, a lot of politicians are very afraid of this huge block of women voters, right? How are they gonna, how, how is this gonna go, right? And at the same time, they're pushing for this infant and maternity, uh, maternity act, right? And so there's a lot of pressure and there's these letters from senators that are saying, I think every woman in my, the state has written me today, you know, and they're just bombarded with letters from all of these different organizations. Um, there was major opposition to the bill. The American Medical Association, the AMA, denounced the, the bill as socialized medicine, and the women of the Children's Bureau as Bolsheviks. Um, oppositional arguments reported that the Shepherd Towner violated states' rights, it threatened private medicine, it was socialism, uh, and it represented a power grab by feminist zealots intent on expanding government control over the family and private medicine. Um, and I have this picture here uh, because this is a lot of what they were doing, right? They were holding these health clinics and basically they'd say, bring your children in and we're going to weigh them and we're going to measure them. And we're going to say, you know what, if you're having trouble latching, we're going to help you breastfeed your baby or we're going to give you some ideas of what you can feed them without. Very basic stuff, right? <laughs> and um, so needless to say, there was a lot of back and forth between uh, this kind of colleagues with the Bolsheviks and waiting babies, right? Uh, they had these little mother's clubs, 
right? So this gets them a little into nativism and Americanism. Uh, so they have these women, little mothers clubs where basically they take children, kind of teach them, uh, you know, how to clean a proper home. Hey, maybe we shouldn't put the chicken on the counter, right? Let's, let's clean the counter first. And this is how you change a diaper and this, that, and the other. But they also were really kind of pushing uh, white middle class values, right? So a lot of the times, um, they, they did have public health nurses that were going into the Southwest that spoke Spanish, um, you know, and African American nurses who were going into African American neighborhoods. But they would go in and say, okay, well, you're eating Italian food, right? There's too much, there's too many spices in there. We need to have you eat something, and some of the recipes are but there's stuff that my grandma, my grandma's from the Depression, and we would eat these, like boiled prunes, you know, and lettuce as a salad, just iceberg lettuce, you know, just really plain, like, <laughs> gives you white people food, you know? And so, um, and so there is a lot of kind of pushback, especially like uh, in, uh, in, in kind of later histories of this stuff that, it, you know, they, they, were, they were kind of trying to push away uh, ethnic and immigrant foods in order for these kind of Anglo foods or whatever. But, um, oh, and this is just, they had a lot of great pictures, right? So the children's year, uh, 1918, 1919, it was just this, this push, uh, you know, all year long, kind of getting your babies out to, to be measured and, and, and let's get, get one of these prenatal care pamphlets in your hand kind of thing. And it, there's all these um, booklets and brochures that you can go to your local library and read them. So you can actually go and you can see the statistics that they were working at and they've got all the footnotes and everything. So if you're really interested in looking at you know, what these kind of social studies looked like, they they are printed. They're printed by the, the government printing office. And you know, I've, I've checked them out of the library at, at UB. You can probably get them at the Erie County Library. A lot of them you can find digitized online. So I just wanted to kind of share that with you, that, that all of this stuff is available to those who are interested. And then I just gave some further reading. I'm always the kind of person when I hear something like this, I want to know some other books I can read. So here's just a few ideas. This Gwendolyn Leaf, Wages of Motherhood. This is one that kind of got me interested in all of this in the first place. Uh, Michelle Mitchell, she's really talking about the African American experience in the uh, progressive era. Molly Led Taylor, Raising the, a Baby the Government Way has all the letters written to the children's bureau. This one is a great book to, to read. And then Robin Munson's Creating a Female Dominion and American Reform is really all about these women reformers um, kind of getting, getting themselves into politics and into the government. So that is it for me. Uh, and it lasted until 1927. Uh, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, the AMA was constantly against it. And uh, in 1927, it did not get refunded. But a lot of the um, kind of things that were included in the Shepherd Towner Act, these kind of infant maternity uh, programs, were either brought back into the Social Security Act uh, during the New Deal, or aid to dependent children, which is also part of the Security, Social Security Act. So, you know, a lot of these progressive reformers or these women, you know, trained kind of the younger generation coming into the New Deal. You know, it came back around. 